All right, hello everybody. Uh, we are back. I am uh, David Gosley. I'm here with John David and Daniel Garner, uh, also known as OG Rose. You know, OG Rose team. <laughs> <laughs> Wife and Dan, Opperman right. Garner, yeah, Rose. So thank you, David. Sure, uh, it's great to be uh, to be with you to discuss chapter four of. Am I right? Fourth five. chapter. Or? Fifth, chapter five of, oh, I, I read the wrong chapter. No, I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Uh, don't worry, I've done that before. <laughs> I have definitely done that. Uh, the fifth chapter in this book, it was titled The Fictions of Factual Representation. Uh, and I oh, I finally have my physical copy. I don't have to rely on a pirated e-copy e of the book. <laughs> um, so as uh, we were talking about before I hit record, uh, there are some repetitions in this chapter. There are, he uh, brings back some of the themes related to style, tropes, the ret rhetorical devices in presentation of historical facts. Um, and we have some examples. Uh, we have uh, some new examples. We have the example of Darwin, which is interesting. We'll get to that uh, maybe later on. And uh, he also presents the progression of historiography. Um, from the 18th century prior to, to the F French Revolution, uh, and then after the French Revolution, 19th century, and to the present day. And he talks about the, the empiricist prejudice that uh, wants to present history and his historiography as exclusively about facts, and there's no fiction in facts, and he, uh, Hayden White wants to continue to get over that prejudice um, to reveal to us the the linguistic devices, the poetic devices that are shared, that are shared in common, both in the presentation of the historical facts and in the presentation of fiction, fictional narratives. Um, I think I'll stop here. Uh, maybe I'll pass it to the next person. <laughs> um, so uh, Davout talked about the um, Hayden White sort of historicizing this problem mm -hmm. of, I guess, the internal politics of what goes on in historiography. And he talks, uh, why talks about how much before about maybe 200 years ago, you had a consensus position um, all over the board that you had fictive elements in historiography. And what he keeps using is the, the, um, the position of the historiographer versus the novelist. And that both modes of representation, both, pe both people are trying to ultimately do the same thing. Um, the novelist is ultimately pointing towards something that only happened maybe in their own head. The historiographer ultimately pointing towards, with their words, towards something that actually happened. But they are both using the tools of language and the tropes of language to do so. So on, on a very superficial level, and it turns out on more than just a superficial level, they're kind of doing the same thing, even though if what they're pointing to is actually located in different spaces of truth. Mm -hmm. One is actually the real world and time which we walk around in, and the other one is um, the, the world of, of, of the novel. But sometime during the 19th century, um, you get this sort of, um, hyper empiricism this positivism that sneaks into historiography which uh, tries to redefine truth as being uh, completely uh, non-fictive in every single way so what it tries to do is uh, hide everything about it that is self-consciously linguistic well, whereas before you would have had writers like and he lists them off he lists Burkhart he lists um uh, Edward Gibbon, as people who are very familiar with how language and uh, causal chains and, and implicature in effect and shape their writing. And then you sort of reach this point where um, he, he, he talks, he, he mentions this quote about um, uh, Hegel, uh, you know, uh, sorry, not Hegel, Nietzsche, um, talking about how a discipline is defined by how it, the gatekeepers, what the gatekeepers do unless you don't do. <laughs> and there comes a point to where there's just these, the gatekeepers and historiography don't want you to talk about 
language. They want you to assume that it's clear and transparent and to sweep everything else under the rug or to sweep that under the rug and to only talk about the facts. Mm -hmm. But the whole point he's making, including we'll talk about later with his um, Darwin example, is that facts never speak for themselves. Yeah. Facts need a language, facts need um, a historian to speak for them. And that speaking is all about the fictive element that he's talking about in the essay. No, that's wonderful, John, and thank you. Yeah, he had that part. I, I, I felt like in this um, section of the book, he, he, he did a very good job of very succinctly and well saying some of the ideas he had been building up to. It's almost like when you, you, know, you keep building and you go, ah, that's, that's a way to say it, where he, he has that part, to your point, John, where he says, uh, historians are concerned with events which can be assigned to specific time, space, locations, events which are or were in principle observable or perceivable, whereas imaginative writers are concerned with both these kinds of events and imagined hypothetical pathetic or invented ones. I thought that was really good. And then he made that great line too, where he said something like, um, readers of histories and novels can hardly fail to be struck by the similarities. I thought that very succinctly kind of captured. And I had this idea of an alien coming down and they were reading, you know, uh, maybe uh, Larson's on the Lusitania or maybe Shelby Foote or something like that. And then you gave him Virginia Woolf and you didn't tell him which was fiction and which was history. The alien actually may struggle to be able to tell like which one is fiction and, and which is uh, which not, which I, it just kind of really kind of hit me quite, quite well. I also really like that part and it reminded me of what we were saying about the chronicle and how a chronicle would be a, a list of facts and he says something on um, 122 a mere list of confirmable singular existential statements does not add up to an account of reality if there is not some coherent logical or aesthetic connecting them to one another that was really lovely because it also made me um kind of think about the fact that like reality actually isn't a collection of facts. It's kind of weird, like um, the event by which I'm sitting here talking with you guys and stuff is moving and the facts are changing. Like I, there's the fact I'm saying this and now the fact I'm saying that and that you're saying, like it's like moving, right? And actually the event, I guess I almost want to call it in a kind of bold yard, you know, the event is almost more fundamental than just the facts. Like if afterwards we then listed everything out in facts, we go, oh, that was like the fundamental reality. And yet in a very funny way, the event is more fundamental than the facts. But then after the event, we create a list of facts and say that that was the fundamental reality. When in fact, we never ever exist in a um, reality that is just a chronicle of facts. So there's this kind of funny move that happens there. And since I've been talking so much um, with Cato Last recently on Hegel and his um, absolute knowing, um, so you have the idea of the truth, which is Wittgenstein, everything that is the case, you know, everything that is the case, collection of facts, where in Hegel, the absolute is everything that is the case plus you you know plus the subject and the funny thing about that is if you're involved then you interact with the facts which changes you which then changes how you interact with the facts and there's this circular motion that you always have to take account of so in hegel like if you're only talking about everything that is the case the truth you're actually not even talking about reality like because you have to include um the the subject and the people that are interacting with those facts and how they make those facts come into existence it, it's almost like if you talk about a chronicle I guess I was, you know, I was, um, my, my grace turns uh, four tomorrow. I don't know where the years go by. And I was, I was, uh, as I was playing with her, I had this idea, like, it's almost like in order for a chronicle to be realistic, it's like this room right now that has the collection of the cup and the computer. It's almost like there'd have to be a big bang, like boom, the start of the universe. And here's the room, just a collection of facts. And here it is. And like, if that's how it worked, and I just gave you a chronicle of facts, if this room just came into existence, would, then that would be accurate. But that, of course, is not how it goes. And, uh, and so it was funny, because I was just reading this section, and it really did kind of strike me how like not it how it really is not the case at all that life is like a chronicle of facts and yet for some reason like you were mentioning john um there was this movement where every i think was it he said everyone blamed mythic thinking for the excesses and failures of the revolution i think he's talking about the french revolution and so there's this idea that oh if we can demystify which then turns into defictionalize we'll actually get more to the truth we won't make those same mistakes when actually that makes things more abstract and less livable and less real, like you're getting the truth, but not the absolute, you're getting a chronicle, but you're not getting the world. So it's kind of funny how that occurred. And then to close before I pass it back to Davood, I almost had this image too. You know how you have those paintings that are the pointillism, where you have a point and you like make it because you just do like points. It's almost like the historians got together and said, dude, this is how we're going to do history. We'll just make little points. And then they'll add up into an image. <laughs> and that's how you get fact, 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 fact. And you keep doing all the little points 
And so at the end, there's this image and someone comes along and say, look, guys, you know, this is the history. And you kind of look at me like, how did you get an image of a swan? I don't know. I just did fact, you know, I just did dots. The swan came out of the dots. Everyone would look at them and go, uh, no, that's not how that works. If those dots added up into a swan, <laughs> there, there must have been a pre-existing structure. You know, you must have had an idea of making a swan. So it's almost like what's happened is they're like historians think that they can do a pointillism picture. And if it's coherent, like if it was just random, like if it was like a big, you'd be like, I can't read this. And it, if you can read it, then people are like, you, you do know you must have had the idea of a swan when you were making that painting, right? And they're like, no, 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 I just, I just listed dots of facts and it, it came together. Um, but, but obviously anyone would look at that and say, no, there must have been a, a structure you had in mind when you were doing that pointillism painting. So that was kind of the, 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 uh, the thing I had, the kind of image I had in mind as I, as I was uh, reading this. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an interesting comparison because if you if, if you know how the eye works and you know the the, the tricks that the eye can play on you mm -hmm. and then the assumptions an eye makes when when it's actually sending messages, what's well, actually not your eye, it's your brain, right? <laughs> the, the, the assumptions that your brain makes, um, that's how that's how pointillism works in the first place. Yeah. So so if you know how language works in the same sense, you can sort of it's it's a very very rough analogy. Mm. Oh sure, that was a great image, and it ties in well with uh, the the part that John uh, mentions the part about the discipline disciplinary prohibitions like the his, mm. the discipline of history prohibits mention of anything other than facts and by prohibit prohibiting by uh, prohibiting uh, that prohibition what it does is uh, it doesn't remove acts of interpretation. Uh, bringing coherence and conceptual organization, but instead a self-conscious use of those things. Now the, the historian has to those, draw those dots on the piece of paper uh, and they end up creating an image, but what they cannot do is that they, they cannot self-consciously admit, they, they yeah. cannot admit to that higher level uh, creativity that they are doing. There was a passage here on uh, page 123 uh, where White is describing the beliefs, the state of affairs prior to the French Revolution um, and how truth was viewed back then. It's uh, in, in the middle of the page uh, where he says, truth, according to uh, them, was not uh, equated with fact, but it is a combination of facts. Uh, so truth was a combination of facts and the conceptual matrix within which it was appropriately located in the discourse. Yeah. So as we have a set of facts. And those facts are organized within a conceptual matrix that makes sense of them. And uh, this uh, reminded me of a book I've been re recently reading. Uh, the book is Taliban by Ahmad Rashid. It was published originally in 2000. And it is a great book. I really, I really like that book. And uh, what is one of the things that is really great about it is that the book is divided into three parts. And the story of Taliban, the or origin of them, the root of the, the, the development. Is it a history of the organization? Yeah, yeah. So in the first of the three parts, uh, Taliban is viewed within the conceptual matrix of politics and military conflict. The second part, again, the same story, but now the conceptual matrix is Islam and religion. Again, the third part tells the story again, this time it is in terms of oil and resources. Uh, so it is really great because at the end, we the reader ends up wondering, similar to how White praises great works of history. At the end, you end up wondering, so which one is it? What, what is the best explanation? If only that facts? third part could have been another thesis, we would have been yeah. on Hegel again. <laughs> Bring it back. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To be another dip, another thing altogether. Uh, so so uh, we have the, the facts. But, uh, I, I think that White here wants to caution us uh, about the potential sacrificing of the facts. Like we shouldn't completely say, okay, it is the image of the duck. It is the big picture that matters. That's the only thing that we are, we are expressing. And the facts are subservient that, to that big picture, to that theory. Uh, instead, what makes a great work of history great is that the facts persist, that they, they have the stubbornness about them and they cannot be completely explained using uh, one theoretical framework. It, it cannot be just explained in terms of uh, the oil, it cannot only be explained in terms of military conflict and foreign intervention, although that's a big part of it, but th there are other elements. 
there are other ways of making that big picture and they all make sense. Uh, um, so, it was, yeah, yeah, go ahead. One of the things that really got me, and this is sort of, I mean, it's completely tangential to the larger point of the essay itself, but the, the, in the beginning of the essay where he's talking about the historical, you know, uh, how history used to be perceived and it's um, major practitioners um, sort of focusing and emphasizing and de-emphasizing certain practices over long periods of time kind of got me interested in the politics, I guess you could say, of certain disciplines mm -hmm. in academia, like how you see, like, um, I guess what you could call what happened in historiography during the 19th century would be an anti-linguistic turn. Mm -hmm. But if you're familiar with what happened about 100 years ago in Anglophone philosophy in England and the United States, um, the, the exact opposite That's happens. Right. It's all about language. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to shove language under the rug, it's it's almost this atomistic dissection of that's what the Tractatus Logical Philosophicus right. is all about, right? right. <laughs> I mean, he um, uh, Wittgenstein, I mean, but I mean A.J. Ayers and John Searle and all that. I mean, they, they spent their entire lives talking about how language works. Right. So, but it's it's interesting how these sort of institutional um, concerns drop and fall and ebb and flow over the centuries. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, no, well, I, I really like that line as well, um, Davoud. And it did make me think, because you know, my wife and I did that thing on critical thinking. And in the paper where we talk about critical thinking, like one of the things is the ability to be aware of the um, the major the, the conceptual matrix that's in operation and actually to move between conceptual matrix, you know, you know, it's almost like, uh, is it 13 ways of looking at a blackbird by Wallace Stevens, you know, the different ways of looking at a blackbird. So like, if you're only staying in a single conceptual, I really like that design of that book. That's brilliant. Uh, because like, if you're only staying in a single conceptual matrix in the paper, we say you can think well, and you can even like really, you can think very well and intelligently, but you don't actually engage in critical thought unless you move between conceptual matrices. And that's where we actually link up empathy and critical thinking a lot because empathy is where you don't just put your shoes in another person's shoes, but you put your feet in another person's shoes and really try to understand the world through their entire framework. And I, and I like, and of course, that's really difficult and much harder, but I really like bringing together um, empathy and critical thinking and to really kind of think of empathy as a very intellectual act, not just something like understanding a person. Now, I like that too, because then understanding requires emotion. It can't just be intellectual. It has to be a whole person. You have to know their history, the social intelligence, like understanding if it gets linked up with empathy and empathy with critical thinking and that moving between conceptual matrices, like, and then that it all kind of comes together and it feels like that's really needed uh, in order to get a more uh, what I call polytheoristic view, not just mono theory, where you have a single conceptual uh, theory or conceptual matrix and you understand everything through. So I really like the design um, of that book. And uh, yeah, John, I, I was very struck as well by this kind of funny movement, you know, pro and then against the anti, that's a really great way to put it, linguistic turn. And, and it's funny how that shows. And I didn't think about that as the political questions of what's going on at the time. That's extremely um, interesting. I The thing, it, it, it was curious to me, I guess I located some of this as the spread of Immanuel Kant's thinking was, was going around the world and becoming more popular because as you accept the premise of the noumenon, you become increasingly, if you take the popular versus the Hegelian interpretation of the noumenon, then subjectivity is what keeps you from truth. And so if you want to get to truth, you need to remove the subject as much as possible. You need to remove subjectivity. You need to just get to the raw facts as much as possible. And even if you can never get to the things themselves, you, they're like acetope lines, I guess. You can get as close as possible. But of course, there's a really big assumption in all of that, which is that subject, subjectivity can be right. I can subjectively be right about X. Just because I'm subjective about X does not mean I am therefore wrong about X. Maybe I'm incomplete. You, you know, you actually can't make the assumption that when I think about this bookcase, um, that what I think about this bookcase has nothing to do with the thing in of itself of the bookcase. You'd have to actually be across the noumenon to know for sure that my take on the bookcase in the phenomenological realm has nothing to do with the noumenon realm. So there's actually been a leap to assume that if there's any subjectivity involved, it's it's always a bad thing, that it's always keeping you from. But if you accept, I think it just helps Mr. Wyden's case, if you accept the, the fact that just because subjectivity is involved, 
that that doesn't necessarily lead to less truth or less accuracy. It may, it's very easy for it to, because you have to work so hard, but it's not necessarily a hindrance to, to the truth, um, to what actually occurred. Then you don't have this hard reaction um, against the involvement of fiction in history or the involvement of a subjective arrangement. There will not be, because, because one, I think White is correct, you can't avoid that, but the fact that you can't avoid it will not lead you to some sort of um, um, epistemological despair that the epi, you know, epistemolo, you know, epistemic despair, nihilism, that we can't know anything. It would only do that if we take um, Kant, who, as we know, had, um, greatly influenced Ayers and all of the, you know, the Vickens, all these different people, uh, as a sort of hard Newman online, you know, as meaning that therefore subjectivity has nothing to do with what's on the other side. So I think that's been a mistake is, is to assume that the involvement of a subject will necessarily keep us from getting to, um, uh, to what the case is, to how things actually are. Did either one of you ever read that great essay by Thomas Nagel that he wrote in the 70s called on The Bat? The Bat One. Yeah, I don't yes. like yeah, which, yeah. which exactly <laughs> ties into what we're talking yeah. about now. Um, I think there is sort of a colloquial naive misunderstanding of what we say when we're talking about subjectivity as yeah. in pure opinion, pure bias, pure, um, um, yeah, just, yeah. You, you can't look at anything fairly, right? But without the subject, you have no facts. You have nothing. Mm -hmm. Because the subject is what does all of the facts. I mean, the, being a subject only means having a mind. That's all it means. And without the mind, you can't gather dates, places, names, let alone, you know, create a narrative which makes sense of any of them. So, well, and again, to your point, John, the event is more fundamental than the facts, if I use that language, right? You know, the facts have to, the facts emerge because of the subjectivity. And so it's this really weird double move where we say we can't rely on the subjectivity, we can only rely on the facts that are possible because of the subjectivity. But hush, hush, you, hush, hush, don't say it. <laughs> right. Sweep it under the rug. <laughs> you, uh, it's, you talked about the difference between uh, truth and the absolute. Maybe we can also talk about the difference between facts and knowledge, uh, or instead of facts, maybe we can say information. You know, we can say things like there's uh, too much information now, uh, but it doesn't make sense to say there's too much knowledge because knowledge re uh, involves knowing people, know knowing subjects. There are people who know, and uh, the other difference between information and knowledge is that information doesn't imply any time, any progression. It doesn't in entail an event. So information amasses and uh, there's no time, it's just space. There's a lot of space that stores that information. On the other hand, knowing takes time. It takes time to spend time with those facts, with, with those pieces of information to gain a knowledge about them. That's why there's a difference between uh, knowledge that comes out of spending time with something for 10 years, 20 years, as opposed to knowledge that comes out of, I don't know, a day, or, or two days. Uh, there was the difference, even if there's no difference between the information, the, there is difference in knowledge in those two scenarios. Now, uh, shall we, is it too soon to uh, get into the Darwin example? So Hayden White brings in Darwin as, and he refers to his work, The, the Origin of Species, as the summa of all uh, <laughs> factual co collections of facts. Uh, and he says that like any work of classic, any, any classic work, any classical work of, of literature uh, that we keep returning to, keep being inspired by, in, intrigued by, uh, it involves both facts and organization, conceptual organization, it, fictive elements that organize the facts. And um, he points to something that Darwin is doing in addition to arranging the, his facts uh, about species, uh, genera, and uh, differences and similarities. So maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, what it is that he's doing, why his work counts as uh, uh, f both fiction and, and factual. Okay, well, I mean, I'm... <laughs> Like I said, I, I read it twice, and I've always found that the examples that he uses to clarify his theory 
are like what makes it worse <laughs> it, it absolutely makes it worse every single time because he, he, is, yes. he uses just the worst examples and it's it's like you could choose such clear just crystal clear examples if you chose another book or another example from the same book but he just wants to like make it hard for you i don't know mm. um yeah. so for, i mean from what i under i mean i remember reading this too um, but he's he's basically just uh, Darwin is is using the um, sort of trope of similarity yeah. as opposed to um, uh, does does he talk about Alfred Russell Wallace or does he just assume that we know who he is? Um, he doesn't talk about Wallace or anybody else. Okay, Any, well, he, alternative he, ways. He, of, he, he, uh, do, he does mention that the basic biological discovery that Darwin had made. Um, let me see the language that he uses. Um, uh, okay, so uh, this is on the, the last page, the tour, three or four sentences from the end of the paragraph on 134. It is not the doctrine of natural selection advanced by Darwin that commended him to other students of natural history as the Copernicus of natural history. That doctrine had been known and elaborated long before Darwin mm -hmm. advanced it in the origin. What had been required was a redescription of the facts to be explained in a language which would sanction the application to them of the doctrine as the most adequate way of explaining them. So he seems to think that evolution was already people thought about it. Well understood. I, I was under the impression that Wallace uh, stumbled across evolution like within a year or two of Darwin. Um, Maybe my knowledge of the history of science is not exactly what it should be, but I thought they discovered it right at the end of the 1850s together. Mm -hmm. But um, but that of course Darwin is is looking at things changing gradually over time, and um, that you know it all depends on how you couch um, the change, right. you know whether it's different um, changes in different kinds or a continual change of one kind. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So assuming that the idea of evolution existed before Darwin, so the, I, the, I, there's this idea of evolution, the concept of evolution, but then uh, nobody managed to present the facts or re-describe the facts in such a way that that idea uh, became sanctioned. So it is the idea that, that it is, the idea requires something to, to seem plausible and that that factor, that event is a redescription, the proper redescription of the facts uh, to make, to, to, to sanction the, this idea of this particular idea of evolution. And uh, my reading of this chapter was that Darwin didn't just uh, sanction the gen general idea of evolution, uh, evolutionary theory, but a specific form of evolution, which emphasizes uh, differences in degree, as opposed to differences in kind. Uh, and then the alternatives that we can discuss include uh, Lyell and uh, Alfred Wallace and other uh, contemporaries, maybe. Yeah, yeah and, and John, I appreciate it. Yeah, um, like you say, John, you read it a bunch of times. You do wonder where Mr. White, you know, he talks all about literature and getting poetic skill and then proceeds to uh, make examples like this. And he totally this. loses it all <laughs> he totally, when he tries yeah, to survive. Exactly. He's, like, he's like, you know, I don't know, Mr. White, if this is going to spread uh, like the origin of species. You know, I'm not sure if this <laughs> structure works so well. I feel like he had a bias to pick Darwin precisely because he claims the single cru crucial question, why are not all organic things linked together and inextricable chaos? You know, and I feel like he's hint, hint, why isn't all of the events of history linked together by instricable chaos, hint, hint, like he's saying, oh, it must be because there's some sort of logic that's connecting it. And what did Darwin do? He brought in, a, he made a parent, he made clear that sort of logic that people had known about evolution, but the structure was not described in such a way that was clear and that people could understand it. So it's almost like, I feel like White was like, and that's what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, and I'm just doing that for mm -hmm. history. So mm -hmm. I felt like that's why he was so bent on going with Darwin, even though, like you say, you do scratch your head on it. Um, mm -hmm. And it, 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 it's, it, it is interesting to think, if he is correct on his understanding of Darwin, that the history and the, of science, the paradigm shift, Kuhn, all of this is actually very much more so almost is what he's saying, more so contingent on the language clicking, on the, the form clicking than the facts themselves. Because if in fact, 
evolution was around for however long versus Darwin, but didn't take off till Darwin. And Wright is claiming that the reason it took off is because Darwin brought the magic skeleton key or of language and connection and way of description that unlocked it. And it's almost like what I, I feel like White's wanting to say, you know, therefore the literary is what actually makes science take off, not the science itself. Mm. You know, he's really trying to not, it's almost like he's trying to position the theory that he's presenting as almost primary in paradigm shifts, not secondary, which is kind of fascinating. Like he's trying to make this move, I felt like, because I, I, because I was reading the Darwin section, I'm like, I'm like, why, what are you doing, man? Why are you going with this example? And I, and I, and I felt like he would, I felt like he, he may have done it because that's the sub, subtle in, um, implications of what he's saying is that the literary getting that right is what causes the scientific paradigm more so than just the knowing of facts. Now you have to grant what he's saying about evolution being known ahead of time. And I guess there are books that claim it was in the, the, um, the Middle East. They had thinkers that thought that I'm not too familiar with all of that. Um, but if it's the truth, then it would then it would seem to be he's suggesting the, uh, the literature is what calls the presentation, the fictional, the presentation of the science is what brings on the paradigm shift, not just the science itself. That's what I felt like he was doing, but that was just my, my take. I wanted to add in case either of you guys or anyone interest, anyone listening is interested, there is a fascinating book by um, an anthropologist who was working in the 1980s named Mary Douglas. Um, she's a cultural anthropologist and she wrote this very, very short, it's all of maybe 150, 180 pages. It's a series of lectures that she gave in England towards the end of her career. And it's called How Institutions Think. Mm. And it is, I, I read it 10 or 11 years ago and I actually reviewed it. It's somewhere on my YouTube channel. And it is, um, she talks about a lot of the same things about how people working in, a common pursuit of something, share, uh, she talks about um, group, uh, collective action theory, and she talks about um, uh, how, what, like what it means to cooperate and humans coming together and like, uh, and she, she discusses, I think it's um, typhus or ty typhoid fever, when people were first discovering what it was, that they were looking for a cogent way to explain the data and that it, it was only until, you know, a few people started putting together ideas in a certain way that there, that the, the actual scientific theory was, was accepted and, and bought into. Mm. It's, it's, it's fascinating, but wow. it, it made me think it's, it's, a, it, it's got a lot of really interesting implications for like the philosophy of medicine and, mm. and, and, and it basically any humanity, um, mm. any, any people working together on a common problem. Um, yeah. Well, to me, that's really fascinating because I guess when I was trying to understand why he did the Darwin example and trying to, you know, saying, oh, it's the, the presentation that unlocks the paradigm shift, it, that, that therefore is kind of a double point because he's saying, one, you can't avoid the fictional structure. And two, the fictional structure is what instigates the paradigm shift if we stick to that language. So why don't you just own the fact that there's a fictional structure and get really good at it and do it well, because that's going to bring on the paradigm shift. So it's like, it's almost like coming at both sides. He's like, one, you can't avoid it. And two, it's good for marketing. So why don't we just all sit down and get rid of this idea of a chronicle of facts and just own, you know, own the role of the, of the fictional structure, because that's actually going to, um, well, that's going to lead to quicker scientific advancements, social change, different things. Like if you really own it, then we can kind of move forward. If we get out of this monotheorist thinking of pure fact chronicle, we can actually advance quicker. I mean, that, that to me, that's really interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to watch a video there, John and Mary Douglas, because like, I couldn't help but read this and go, oh, well, so if we, if we actually own the fact there's a fictitious, you know, a, a fictional structure, it would actually accelerate, possibly have an accelerational dimension to scientific advancement. And I, I don't, I don't remember if I talk about that, you know, the, the typhoid, because I did it, you know, 10 or 11 years ago, sure. but, but I was fascinated because I was thinking, you know, microbiologists here, you know, 80, 100, 120 years ago when they were doing this, um, this is a matter of observation, recording, uh, comparing notes, making sure your data looks like my data, and then we publish the paper, right? There's so much more that, I mean, when you just sort of end up looking at it, um, that actually goes into the sociology of, of what's going on and how people are working together to create a convincing idea 
that you can sell as science. It was, you think of all things that biology would be the most, you know, transparent, but even biology needs its own story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to add this note about the difficulty of this uh, essay in general and what the notes that you made about the examples making things more difficult. I think part of that has to do with uh, Hayden White having in mind as his readers primarily people who are in, in opposition. In, they, they have a con contrary to the way. And the clue, one clue is in the opening sentence of the, this chapter, <laughs> which is, it, quote, in order to anticipate some of the objections with which historians often meet the arguments that follow. So it begins with uh, just this is a, for people who have these objections. The other passage I wanted to uh, to read from page 127 is uh, this passage is about the, the effect of uh, using rhetorical devices and language, fictive element of presentation on reflectively and how that becomes even more obvious than if you're doing it self-consciously, if you own up to the, to the fact that you are using uh, fictive elements. So this is the second paragraph in the page. Uh, he says, I would argue that these mythic modes are more easily identifiable in historiographical than they are in literary texts, for historians usually work with much less linguistic self-consciousness than writers of fiction do. They tend to treat language as a transparent vehicle of representation that brings no cognitive baggage of its own into the discourse. So they, that, that way of treating it actually makes them kind of like even more obvious in their rhetoric. Their rhetoric becomes more obvious because they are denying it. Anyways. No, I really like that part. And then he also kind of in line with that, he mentioned Tocqueville. He said, um, mm -hmm. Tocqueville writes about the French Revolution, but he writes even more meaningfully about the difficulty of ever attaining to a definite objective characterization of the complex web of facts that comprise the revolution as a graspable totality or structured whole. So one of the reasons Tocqueville is great is because he's aware of the problems of historiography, like, and he's incorporating that into it. Likewise, the writer of fiction, like I can tell you doing the short stories or the poems we just submitted, you know, all the places open on September 1st, uh, like you're really aware of the connotations of words, of the structures of the words, how Azura is not the same as Serlaine, blues are not, there's not just one kind, like you're super aware of it um, because you have to in the field. Whereas if you're just like, ah, Sir Lane is blue, it's as good as Azura, who cares? Navy, Azura, blue, it's all the same. No, no, it has a different visual image. And, and then likewise, you know, saying hard, difficult, you know, those have different connotations for different um, impenetrable, you can come up with these different terms. So writing does make you very aware of that. And also aware, I think also in fiction, precisely because you're trying to lead someone it, someone in a direction without turning on their alarm bells that they're being led or they predict where the plot is going like you don't want them to guess the plot ahead of time right so you have to but you also have to have enough elements that when the ending comes it makes sense so you're always kind of aware that you're leading your reader the historian writes as if they're not leading the reader anywhere like there's not the secondary level that's going on i'm just presenting the facts no 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 you are necessarily bringing them in a, in a direction and that's either good or bad. That doesn't mean it's a bad direction, but you need to be aware that that's sort of, that's, that's occurring. Um, and, I, and I do think fiction writers are more aware. So I found it really interesting how we talked about Tocqueville having this kind of awareness that this was going on as it was right. And I, and I linked that, I marked that uh, to, the, to the, the passage that you, you read, because I really like that passage too. That's I just wanted, yeah. to, I wanted to add yeah. one thing before we, I don't know, came close to wrapping it up or something that um, Daniel, you asked a, um, a rhetorical, ha ha, get it? That joke. Um, question um, about <laughs> what, why, why don't you just come out and admit the fact that you're dealing with language? I mean, that would make things so much, that would make things so much easier. You could get good at it. Yeah. And then you wouldn't have to deny that you were doing what we all know you're doing in the first place. And I know you know the answer to this and Davud knows the answer to this, but anyone who else who may not be watching, who, who doesn't have the, uh, the, the, the benefit of reading along and sort of following what he's clearly saying about the, the like I said, the internal politics of the profession of historiography as time goes on today. Well, maybe not today, but, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you know, historians really have this, um, they still have that attitude from the 19th century 
or many of them did, that if I were to talk about language, I wouldn't be a historian anymore. I would be a philosopher or even worse, a philosopher of history. And then I can therefore no longer be a real historian who just deals in facts. Yeah. Um, I'd be one of those namby-pamby poetic, you know, whatever. And I wouldn't be dealing in things that really have, you know, that sort of naive right. BS. Right. But um, that, that is why a lot of people, I mean, you still get people like that. I mean, oh, yeah. uh, Richard yeah. Evans, sure. uh, who used to be a, a Regis professor of history at Oxford or Cambridge. I mean, he, he's attacked, um, uh, I think I mentioned this a few videos ago, attacked Cambridge, uh, attacked uh, Hayden White for, right. for basically paying too much attention to stuff like this. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I can also attest to the to the this, uh, the fact that um, in circles in in uh, academic circles where psychology is uh, viewed as a science, a hard science, uh, philosophy is actually a dirty word to to call someone oh, yeah. uh, a philosophical or to point out that somebody's doing something philosophical. We gave birth actually, to psychology, right? <laughs> but but to describe that now has become <laughs> a, a, a deri deri derisive. Uh, description oh, yeah. unfortunately and i haven't really talked to you david about your your discontent well too much with your discontent with with academics mm -hmm. i mean the, the academic life but i wouldn't be surprised if some of the stuff that we and i'm not asking you to divulge any information i'm just like throwing I ideas out there right now. <laughs> <laughs> that you might be a little bit um uh, I don't know, disconcerted, like deflated about the fact that every discipline seems to just have its ebb and its flow of ideas and that there's nothing really, I mean, it's like, whose side are you on? Mm -hmm. Are you a structuralist or are you a post-structuralist? Are, mm -hmm. are you a humanist or are you a, um, um, are you a, a Freudian or a Jungian? Are you, a, are you this or a that? And mm -hmm. for, for every discipline, you can, you can have those you know, those coin, those coin toss choices mm. where it's either a dichotomy or a trichotomy or whatever else. But, you know, usually people expect you to come down on a side. On a camp, and, right, right. And, a camp. And pe people, don't, people don't want to listen to sophisticated arguments. They want you to pick a side. Right. Right. Because uh, usually it happens that people do end up with a side. Usually it's the side that happens to also be their advisor's side. Of course. Then, <laughs> or the head of the department side. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, th and the advantage of that, the practical advantage of that is that all these uh, scholarly works that required the intellect and the imagination turn into, very effectively, turn into procedures and uh, technical moves. So it becomes, knowledge becomes techne. Uh, and then you can repeat uh, what your advisor or what the head, what the head of the department has been doing, you don't need to really uh, think too much, uh, or not much. And it's also on the other side, on the side of the teachers, it is easier to sh to teach you a set of procedures and make sure that you become productive as quickly as possible. So it has those ad those types of advantages, but those advantages we would agree are not scholarly. They don't uh, produce. Uh, <laughs> They, they produce publications, but the degree to which they produce wisdom is more questionable. Yeah, to, yeah, to say the least. <laughs> well, well, and I think there are, like you're saying, there's practical reasons for the reality. But I think one of the reasons we're seeing this surge of people on online, I, I know we're, we're all, in, we can't avoid bubbles, but there's this interest in online, you know, watching YouTube channels, you know, conversations like this is because there's this hunger, to use my term, for polytheorism, like people who move between multiple theories, structuralism, you know, go to it looks to religion, but then also comes to secularism. You also have this group of people that seems, and maybe it's the internet, where it's like, I don't wanna just be an economist. You know, I don't wanna just be an expert on Keynes or something or money velocity. I also wanna understand like the history of money and also the philosophy of money. And I don't wanna just be an expert on one thing because it feels so siloed. Now, at the same time, there's a danger between being a generalist and you're not good, you know, the jack of all trades and the expert of none. So there's something to be said about specialism. I always like how Dietrich McClowski put it. He says, you know, specialize in something, but read widely. 
right? You know, specialize, but read widely, you know, and see men outside of the field, because, you know, very often it's actually by going outside the fields that you can see economics from a different angle. You can see the role of sociology. I mean, I think I, I won't get into it, but I think like we've really actually misunderstood a lot of the wealth of nations by not taking the sociology that Adam Smith is talking about. We just think about it in terms of small systems and all these different things. But, it, but anyway, um, so I think the internet has kind of unveiled that there's this uh, explosion of a desire for polytheorism to, to avoid institutional capture because people, well, because if I bring back to what I was saying, you know, you have the truth, which is everything that is the case. And then you have the absolute, which is everything that, that is the case, plus us, plus us and our reaction to those facts of which then change us, which change how we, the new facts that arise, and you have this sort of process. And the thing is, if the only, the absolute though is the truth plus us. So you need to know the truth. That's why the facts matter. Like you have to know everything that is the case. But if you only have the facts or the data, you know, data but not information, then you'll feel you'll feel like you have a lot of explanations, but you won't feel addressed, you know, is the language I like to use. Like people like, we don't just want to go into learning to explain things. We also want to address the world we live in. Like we want to understand how it's here and how we fit into it. Now there's dangers in that because your desire for meaning and understanding can override the facts and you start looking for things. But that but you see, that's the beauty of polytheorism. Like the why do you get, you get all these dialectical for like, and you, you have them compete with one another, just like Hayden White is talking about the different complex, the um, conceptual apparatuses, they compete with one another. You can better, you can better balance that. Uh, so to find, I think uh, for me, what Hayden and White invites you into is a way of thinking that doesn't sacrifice the truth, but also doesn't just leave you in the realm of pure explanation without any address. Because by bringing in the fiction, you can see a story. And since you live a story, none of us live a chronicle, you can learn from it better and then work to try to get to get at it, uh, you know, to not just settle with some sort of pure relativism. So, you know, I have some hope in that I, I, I feel like, you know, uh, there's a lot of pessimism out there in the world today, but actually just seeing on the internet, this sort of explosion of academic interest and different things shows me that there's a lot of people who, um, you know, who, who want to, to get to stuff that matters and to not and to do it outside of institutional capture, not because institutions are inherently bad. I don't want to live in a world without institutions. You can go too far either way. But one also does have to acknowledge that there can be institutional capture. And there, the fact that you have so many people that are on their own seeking a, a spear to 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 seek um, address, not just explanation, to seek you know, all of all of these different uh, ideas kind of gives me gives me hope, uh, despite all of the uh, craziness that can be out there sometimes. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank gentlemen. you. It's Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, it was a pleasure. <laughs> Until next time. Hi.